Okay, let's get started. Where has the time gone? We're uh, on the edge of uh, Thanksgiving break here. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about where we are and where we're, we're going. Don't come to class on Monday. Well, come to class if you want. Um, Are there letters in the building? I don't know. You can try and find out. Uh, so we've got Thanksgiving recess, and you are going to be working on your second report over the Thanksgiving break and doing some user testing. So when you pack up tonight or tomorrow, do not forget to take your Leap Motion device home with you and your, and your laptop. Any questions about the second report? No, we're all good? Okay, so uh, when we come back from Thanksgiving recess, we will finish uh, our discussion of robotics and this, sesh and this section on uh, looking outward and thinking about interactive technologies that are interacting with the physical environment, they're interacting with humans, and they're also interacting in the physical world, perhaps with other instances of themselves. So we're going to talk today about robot-robot interaction, what happens when we have a mobile interactive technology, a robot that's moving around and needs to interact with the physical world, needs to interact socially in the right way with humans and with its fellow robots. We'll talk about a research project uh, out of our group to finish that section off when we get back after Thanksgiving recess. And then we will enter into the last theme of the course, which is looking inward, right? So sort of going in the other direction, sort of the blurring of the line between virtual reality and physical reality. So we'll look at VR, then we'll look at AR or augmented reality. Then we're going to talk a little bit about wearables, so interactive technologies that are on your skin. And we will finish in lectures 27 and 28 with implantable technologies. So technologies that are interacting with the human host, but doing so under the skin. Right? We're moving into a brave new world of cyborg technology and direct uh, brain-computer interaction. So we'll end the course of HCI with BCI, the next frontier. Okay, then we have a uh, week off, uh, and then we will be back here for the exam period in which you will be presenting orally your uh, final system. We have uh, 37 students signed up, and we've got a little less than three hours, so you're going to have between three and five minutes to present, not a lot of time. We'll talk more about what's expected during your oral presentation when we come back to after Thanksgiving break. Sound good? Any questions about where we're going? No? Okay. So, um, we are working our way through lecture 22 last time, HRI, or Human Robot Interaction. So we have, uh, I drew this little cartoon for you last time, where we have a robot which is acting on its environment and sensing the repercussions of its action. There are also, of course, humans in its vicinity that are also acting on the physical environment and sensing the repercussions. Human-robot interaction is focusing on this loop where the human acts on the robot or to the robot or with the robot. The robot senses what the human does and the robot acts accordingly. And when the robot acts, the human senses what the robot did, right? So we've got this very special feedback loop between a robot in a, and a human, which are in very close physical proximity to one another. So obviously we have to think very carefully about this particular kind of feedback loop. There's some things that are special about this feedback loop compared to the one with the physical environment. What distinguishes social interaction from the point of view of the robot from physical interaction? We talked about a number of things last time. What does the robot have to pay particular attention to when it's interacting with this thing in its environment called a human? It's absolutely, right? Whatever, whatever the human is doing, the robot is sensing that in order to really get a clue and try and figure out what the, what the human's intentions are, pay attention to the face most of the time. Right? Okay. So pay attention to the face or face recognition. This is one of four social building blocks that we were looking at last time. And again, there's hundreds of social building blocks that humans 
engage in when they interact with each other. We're just picking a few, some of which are relatively easy for robots to do, like VOR, staying focused on something that's in their field of view, um, recognizing faces, harder, but now is basically a solved problem in AI and robotics. And we ended last time with joint attention, which is harder still, right? So you've identified a face in the environment, and that face or that human is trying to get you to do something, which most of the time is pay attention to something. I'm paying attention to this, and I would like you to jointly attend to this thing as well. How do we know when someone wants us to do that? We can be very explicit. I can tell you, please have a look at the slides. I can point, or I can look at the slides, right? And most of the time, instinctually, if you're in a social interaction with someone and they look away from your eyes to something else, if you pay attention to this, you'll notice that you usually do too. You try and jointly attend to whatever it is has captured the attention of the interlocutor or the person that you're engaged with. Okay, how do we get a robot to do this? Well, as we figured out, we need to be very, very specific about what in the face is the clue that tells the robot or the other human what the person is looking at. And uh, so there's an interesting paper, it's a little bit older now, but it's an interesting idea, and again uses machine learning to try and get a robot to learn how to do this. Do this. So in this case, we're going to start with a robot that does not know how to perform joint attention, and it's going to learn how to do so through trial and error. Okay, so here's our robot here. It's not very sophisticated. Um, it's basically a box sitting on a table. It has, however, an active vision system. So it's got these two cameras on top, and at any point in time, there are two motors that can pan the camera, the pair of cameras left, right, and tilt up or down. So you'll notice, uh, it might be difficult to see here, there's a theta pan and a theta tilt. So two numbers which is the current angle of the cameras. So the robot knows the direction its cameras are pointing in. And the robot can act on its environment in a very simplistic way, which it can, it can send delta thetas, so changes in pan and tilt. So the robot can say, I want to pan and tilt my head so that I'm looking in this direction. Okay. Okay, so um, the robot is looking at a human caregiver who is going to help the robot learn how to perform this important social building block, which is joint attention. Um, how does this work? Well, we, the robot starts, and this is the, uh, an outline of the algorithm. The robot is going to start by focusing the caregiver's face in its uh, center of view. These investigators did not use the ratio template algorithm. They used something else, but it doesn't really matter. But we are assuming that our robot already knows how to find and then saccade or look at faces, right? So maybe the robot recognizes there is a face in the upper right part of its visual field. So it will pan and tilt its cameras so that now the face is centered in its field of view. Okay. Once it's done that, it may notice that there are other objects aside from faces in its field of view. So if you look at this middle rectangle here, in this cartoon example here, the robot sees the human's face, and it also sees a star and a diamond. And the robot will, uh, the robot will now move the camera so that it's no longer centering the human face, but it's centering one of these two objects. At the beginning, we're assuming that our robot doesn't know much. It's trying to learn. It doesn't know whether the human is actually attending to one or neither of these objects. So it just rotates. It picks one of these <laughs> objects at random and rotates the camera so that now that object is in its field of view. So it started by looking at the human, and then it saw something else in its field of view and looked at that other object. So we have a two-element vector here, delta, theta, which are just the two numbers that indicate how the robot's cameras pan and tilt. So far, so good? Okay. So if the robot is going to learn, obviously, we need to get some reinforcement. So reinforcement is the caregiver giving positive reinforcement. Good job. 
you actually did happen to attend to the object that I was looking at, or negative reinforcement, thumbs down, no, you looked at the wrong object. I was attending to the diamond, but you chose to look at the star instead. Okay, so the robot and the caregiver are going to do this many times, and they're going to, and the robot is going to try and build up, is going to try and use a machine learning algorithm to do this so that most of the time it gets positive reinforcement rather than negative reinforcement. Okay, how is the robot going to learn? In this case, we've looked at sort of different machine learning algorithms. In this case, the robot is using a neural network, and we don't have time in this class to go into neural networks. Suffice it to say that they are simple mo learning models based on the human brain. So in a neural network, it's a network, we have nodes and edges. The nodes, or the white circles here, correspond to simple neurons, and the lines correspond to connections between neurons, otherwise known as synapses. At the front of the network here, we're going to supply all the RGB values from the robot's cameras, so the robot can see. And we're also going to supply the current two angles of the neck, if you like. So the robot knows what it's seeing, and it knows its current uh, the current angle of its camera. So the sensation for the robot, what it sees and what it feels, goes in the left side of this neural network, and out the back come two numbers, which are the actions, right? So the robot senses, it thinks, and then it acts. The deltas tell it how it's going to move, and obviously we're looking for it to learn the right thing. Okay, so how does it do that? Again, at the beginning, this neural network is all randomly connected up. So when it sees a face and it, it gets input these neck angles, it does something at random, and the, and the caregiver says, good job or bad job. If it does something and the caregiver says, good job, the robot does nothing. It does not change this neural network. If, on the other hand, the caregiver says, thumbs down, you looked at the wrong object, the robot will make slight changes to this neural network. And I'm not going to go into the details of how it makes changes, but it goes in and makes slight changes. If the robot makes slight changes in here, what happens the next time the robot gets exactly the same input? So, yep. It's going to act slightly different, right? So who knows what it will do, but from time to time, when presented with the same situation, the first time the, the, uh, the human caregiver said, wrong, make a little bit of a change, and by chance, now it happens to do the right thing, human says, good, you learned something. In this case, you did the right, the right thing. If we do this enough, by making these changes, the robot will start to get better and better at what it's doing. Yes? The nodes are black box. What do you mean by black box? How the computer changes and what changes they make. We have no idea what it means. We just know the results. Yes. So for those of you that have heard about artificial neural networks before, they are extremely powerful. The price you pay for using an artificial neural net network is that they are black box. So in this case, when this robot actually does learn to do joint attention, it's very hard to look inside and look at this network and know how the robot is figuring out how to look at the object that the person is attending to. That, so certain machine learning algorithms are white box and others are black box. Your KNN learner is white box in the sense that whenever your learner makes a prediction, you can go inside and see the 30 element vector that it got, that it was trying to predict, and you can go in and say, see the 15 other vectors or the 15 other gestures that were closest to that new gesture, and you know exactly why your KNN learner predicted the digit 3 or the digit 6. You can figure it out. That's a white box method, much harder to do with an artificial neural network. There is, however, research going on at the moment to try and turn neural networks from black boxes into white boxes. Kelly, did you have a question? Same question. Same question. Okay, so 
in this particular research report, it actually worked. Why it worked, it's hard to say. So I made a little cartoon here. This is how it may have learned, but who knows, right? Remember that the robot is receiving, uh, is receiving visual stimulation, so it sees the caregiver's face. As we know from our discussion last time, all you really need, most of the time, all you really need is where are the pupils in the human's eyes relative to the whites of the eyes. So imagine that this, this neural network changes over time to throw away all the pixels except eight of them. The four that fall on the left eye and another four that fall on the right eye. And in this little cartoon example here, um, it's basically looking to see is the pupil looking down right? And if the pupil is down right, like in this example here, that means pixel 2, 2 will be dark. Pixel 2, 1, pixel 1, 1, and pixel 1, 2 will be white or much brighter than P2. Right? This is like a variant on the ratio template algorithm. If it senses that, then it knows the human from its point of view is looking down right. How should the robot pan and tilt its camera? Should it also pan down and to the right? Sorry, pan right and tilt down? It should it be the opposite? It, would pan left. It, it should do the opposite, assuming that the robot is facing the human head on, right? If the robot is sitting obliquely, it might be something else. But let's assume for this simple <laughs> example that the robot is facing the human. So when the human pans uh, down right, the robot should do not exactly the opposite. The robot should do what? down left, right? And if the human looks down left, the robot should look down right. So it, think about this ne neural network here. It's taking all this raw sensor data, throwing most of it away, only paying attention to the pupils relative to the whites of the eyes, figuring out the, what direction the human is looking, and then outputting the corresponding action. Not the same action, but what it should do when it notices that the human is looking down left, down right, up left, up right. Now whether the neural network actually learned some version of this little cartoon down here, who knows? <laughs> hard, hard to say because it's black box. But it did learn to jointly attend to what the human was looking at. Yes? Are neural networks like this more robust than if you were to program in, let's say by hand, calculate the vector of where the eye is looking? And if it goes outside of their right. vector, then you can follow that? Is, uh, that more, is this more robust in the sense of... That's a good question. You may not know how it works, but it but, works in more situations? Absolutely. So the general rule of thumb is, yes, absolutely. The more experience a neural network gets, the more robust it becomes. That's why Google cars are driving around with that little thing on the top, right? They're collecting millions and millions and uh, miles of sensor data to train autonomous cars to say, this is a shadow and I can drive over it, or this is a human pedestrian and I should not drive over it. it that is exactly what's going on inside uh, Google's autonomous cars. It is a much, much bigger network, but that's exactly what it is. And our entire society wants to know what the answer to that question is, which is how much data do you need for an autonomous car to be successfully robust, right? It sees something in the road. It's never seen that particular thing before. It's not in its training set. Is that thing a shadow, an empty plastic bag, a human child? Okay, again, we could have a very long discussion about neural networks, but uh, um, they're black box. We don't necessarily know how they work, and you need a lot of data to get them to be robust. <laughs> So the investigators in this, exper in this experiment, if you want to go back and read the paper, they spent a lot of time saying yes, yes, no, yes, no, yes, 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 no, until they could train this robot to jointly attend to, to something just by looking at it. So now, after training, they could sit in front of this robot, they could put objects in front of themselves, and they could look at the objects, and the robot would move its head and look at what they, were, what they are looking at. Okay. 
Okay, let's move on to the fourth and final building block that we're going to look at. Um, assuming that you want to hold a conversation with your robot, you're going to have to engage in turn-taking. This one is actually pretty straightforward, right? So I'm a robot. I hear certain raw audio, which corresponds to you talking. I see your lips moving. You're talking. I wait till you stop. Then I talk. And then I stop. I see you talk. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay. So, um, I'm going to show you a couple video clips now taken, taken from an experiment. Um, actually, this is back in the 1990s at MIT by Cynthia Brazil. Um, I showed you Cynthia's Kismet robot before. Um, Cynthia's now got her spin-off company and they're developing Jibo, which is based on a lot of this early research, right? How do you build in these social building blocks to get something that at least gives the impression that it is engaged and paying attention to the human interlocutor? Okay. Okay, I'm going to show you the videos first, so I'm not going to tell you too much about what's going on inside Kismet's head. Perhaps you can figure it out from watching the, the videos. This was an interesting experiment because once they had built some of these social building blocks into Kismet, some of the grad students went outside uh, the research building in Cambridge, Mass, and just grabbed people off the street and said, would you like to talk to a robot? Some people said yes. So, like your naive testers over Thanksgiving break, these are people that have never seen Kismet before. These are probably tech-savvy people because they're uh, around the MIT buildings in Cambridge, Mass, but they've never seen Kismet before. Okay, here we go. Again, this is from the 90s, so I apologize for the video quality here. Hi. <laughs> Hello? Do you like Hi, I'm not sure. Hello? Hi, how are you? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. This was Kismet and... Kismet and Hannah, how impressed do you think Hannah was with Kismet's social abilities? Not very. Why not? What was, which building blocks here were failing? Was he even speaking English? Yeah, I couldn't tell what I was saying. I, I didn't know if it was my hearing. Or... Okay, so I'll play you another video which is longer and you can maybe figure it out. So it's kind of hard to hear what Kismet's saying, right? So that doesn't help very much. Facial expressions are bizarre. Kismet's, wh whose facial expressions? Well, Kismet's? <laughs> okay. Okay. That's, uh, that's Hannah. I'm going to show you uh, Rich now. And again, this is just Kismet. They made no change to the code. Actually, I don't remember whether they tested this with Hannah first or Rich first. Here goes uh, Kismet and Rich. This one's a little longer, about two minutes. I like you, Kismet. You're a pretty funny person. Now laugh. Do you laugh at all? I laugh a lot. Carol says I laugh a lot. I try not to laugh at her. <laughs> okay. You're adorable. Who are you? What are you? Hi, <laughs> Yeah, I want to show you something. This is, okay, this is a watch that my this is a watch that my girlfriend gave me. Oh, yeah, look, it's got a little blue light in it too. You're like, I almost lost it this week. <laughs> how, how are you? You know what it's like to lose something? <laughs> you are amazing. Yeah. I'm gonna try closing my eyes. Let me try opening my eyes. Maybe my teeth. Yeah, I think so. Are you close? Well, I won't. Try to open. No, stop. <laughs> oh no. 
no, no, I, I gotta talk that. No, no, stop. <laughs> listen to me, listen to me. I think we have something going on. Uh, I think there's something here between us. Stop, you gotta let me talk. Stop. Shh, 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 shh. Kismet, I think we got something going on here. You and me. You're amazing. What are you? Bye. Oh, you are You know what? Hang on a second. I still want to talk to you. I got a couple more things I want to say. Okay, right at the end, did you I hear like Rich say, man. hold on a second, I got a few more things I want to talk to you about. So I think they had uh, subjects come in for about a 10, 15 minute session. Rich stuck around for two and a half hours talking to, <laughs> talking to Kismet. They had to, I think they had to eventually kick him out of the, the lab. Could probably hear the grad students in the background. They were trying to maintain a very professional and neutral demeanor and they were laughing and you know, this was, this particular interaction was I think more than the investigators wildest dreams about what would happen with Kisma. Why so different? Same hardware, same software. What happened? What was the difference between Rich and Hannah? He was much more active, right? So in a social interaction setting, right, who's, who's leading and who's following, right? It's often not, not clear. Remember when we saw Deb Roy's experiment with his three-year-old child, right? It was very unclear once you started to look at the data whether the parents were teaching the child or whether the child was teaching the, the parent, right? So Hannah sat very still. She didn't move her face. She kept saying the same thing over and over again. Rich was the exact opposite. What was Rich doing to engage, what was going on in this actual feedback loop that was drawing Kismet into this social exchange? Or enriching this social exchange? Well, he was moving back and forth, like trying to draw his attention to him. Why was he moving back and forth? Right, he was trying, he was trying to draw Kismet's attention. He was trying to test whether Kismet was able to do that, right? You're sitting in front of this thing which is kind of animate, kind of not, you know, how much, how, much, how socially aware is this thing, right? So Rich is really carrying out a lot of social experiments to try and figure out what Kismet is capable of. And tracking my eyes as I move is a pretty important one, right? So building block one and two are definitely in there. What else did Rich do to test Kismet? Absolutely. So he actually said, I want to show you my watch. And Kismet did not look at the watch. And Rich saw that Kismet did not look at the watch after he had said, I want to show you my watch. What do you think Rich was able to derive from that micro exchange? She, the robot doesn't have any sense of the vocal. What you're saying is more like the motion that he made to his watch him moving. Right. Does Kismet speak, speak and understand English? Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't seem like it, right? However, right? So if you're trying to engage with someone who doesn't speak your mother tongue, what do you do? You fall back on gestures, right? I want you to pay attention to this. Um, Rich could have pulled back his sleeve and just looked at his watch, but he didn't. Why do you think he probably chose to gesture rather than look? To make it much more obvious, right? So over time, it seems that Rich, Rich's social uh, exchanges are like with a young child, right? This young child doesn't speak English yet. Um, this child is probably not able to do visual joint attention using my eyes. So I will try and give more obvious visual cues about where I want us to jointly attend. What else did... Uh, what else did Rich do to exaggerate this exchange, to make things, to scaffold Kismet's social experience here? He pointed at his watch. What else did he do? Try to <laughs> distance. Sorry? If the robot would know how close the space was to the robot's face. Absolutely. Does Kismet have a sense of personal space, right? Is that important here? When he moved his head to the right, it's, at one point, he went like this. What does this mean? Absolutely, right? So he knew Rich either consciously or unconsciously realized that Kismet was able to follow his pointing to the watch. K 
he, he is now instinctively trying to teach kismet to learn <laughs> things from uh, eye gaze, right? So he's saying, attend to my eyes. He knows that kismet pays attention to gesture, so can you scaffold the learning of what I'm doing with my eyes from gesture data? Okay. What else happened? He was trying to see if it would talk over. Okay. Exactly. And it did a more or less good job, except when it started to talk over him. And what did he do in that case? Listen. Listen to me. And then when it still talked over him, this. And then he was actually shaking his finger at it, right? And what did Kismet do in response? sort of dipped its head in contrition, right? I'm sorry, I didn't realize. So Rich was g tr trying to give negative reinforcement. You are now breaking the turn-taking uh, rule, and I'm trying to give you negative reinforcement so you learn from whatever just happened, from your point of view, to not do it the next time around. And by kismet dipping its head, that's acknowledging that it knows that it just received negative reinforcement. Kismet may not know what it did wrong, but it knows that it did something wrong, right? So Rich pulled back, right, and said, okay, there's no, there's no need to continue scolding Kismet. It got it. Hopefully it will do some learning and do a better job next time. Okay, last exchange with Kismet. We saw Hannah and we saw Rich. How about Adrian? Gee, oh, gee. Okay, who's teaching and who's learning here? I don't know, it's not really clear. There is a very clear additional social building block that is going on here, and it's being exhibited by both of them. Actually, no, it's being exhibited only by the human in this case. What's that? He's, I mean, he's repeating everything he's saying. Imitation, right? So children at this age, we looked at ages 9 to 24 where they start to absorb language like a sponge. Before that, they're, they're absorbing everything else like a sponge, right? Whatever they see and hear, can they imitate it, right? So kismet is not imitating the child. It's just doing its turn-taking in the other building blocks. What? The child clearly is in this in this case. Okay, so you've heard Kismet quite a bit now. What is Kismet saying? It probably doesn't understand English. Is it speaking English? What is it speaking? Absolutely nothing. They're just random English phonemes strung together in random sequences, right? It's babbling. However, clearly that's not, that's not, um, doesn't matter here, right? Kismet can already start to draw humans into social exchange without having to understand English. Why didn't they give him some sort of a vocabulary? The reason they didn't give it a vocabulary is because they want to see how much, how much interaction can go on between a human and a robot non-verbally. Right? So language is kind of the last thing that a child starts to add on as it becomes socially competent. Right? There's a huge amount that you can get done interacting with another human without actual language. Right? Hopefully, in the case of someone like Rich, Rich might now be willing to, tr to try and help teach kismet language. Right? But what can we do pre-language? Clearly, from this experiment, quite a lot. OK. OK, so we're going to finish off lecture 22 here um, with an in-class exercise. So again, we would like to develop robots that can work in close proximity with humans, but they need to obviously be careful when they do so. And we'd like to try and cobble together some of these social building blocks to make a robot that can work well with, with a human. One possible uh, application of such socially aware robots would be rehabilitation. For any of you that have had to do any physical therapy, you're working with a therapist who demonstrates actions, watches how you respond, tries to show you how to expand your range of motion a little bit, back and forth, back and forth for hours and hours and hours on end. Physical therapy is a time-consuming activity. Could we try and offload some of this 
repetition, relearning, repetitive relearning to a, uh, to a robot rehabilitation uh, device in this case. So again, this is just hypothetical at the moment. Um, so as an example, we have this rehabilitation robot. It's learning. The robot looks at the therapist first, and the therapist says, okay, patient X is going to come in in a few minutes. I want you to work on the following with patient X. The physiotherapist demonstrates certain actions, and the robot learns to imitate those actions. Then uh, the subject comes in, the patient comes in, and the robot observes the patient exhibiting limited range of motion. The robot imitates but slowly increases the range of motion, which is trying to signal to the patient, push yourself and see if you can repeat the action but expand your range of motion a little bit. And the robot should provide some sort of social signal about when the human should try this. Okay. Here are the four building blocks we talked about. Uh, we just introduced a fifth one, which is imitation. So turn to your neighbor and think about these kinds of micro exchanges we, we want the robot to engage in with the human physiotherapist and with human uh, patients. How would you put together these building blocks to realize these interactions? I'll give you a few minutes to think about that, and then we'll see what you came up with. I'm sorry, I was a little unclear. You can flesh out the rest of this rehabilitation robot example, or if you want to think about another application where a socially aware robot would be useful, that's fine too. Yeah, it's like, 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 like
I wonder like how much of our reversion is based on the size of our size. I mean, that might be it. I'd be curious to like show that on Okay, what uh, what sorts of ideas did you come up with? Assuming we want to allow these kinds of robots in our everyday lives to begin with, right? Which is a very good question to think about first. Yes? One idea that um, we had was like from the court stenographer robot. Okay. Um, I don't know if it would use the first building block, but I mean like it essentially would be a camera that could like move around to focus on whoever's talking. Um, uh, it could pay joint attention if someone's gesturing at like a exhibit A or whatever that is. Okay. Um, and then if like the judge wants it to read back something, it would have to, you know, do some work for it. Okay. Turn taking, yep. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like an interesting application. Yes. Uh, maybe a computer in the gallery or museum. Okay, makes sense. So we would have to figure out when someone so again, you have to be pretty socially sensitive in that situation, right? Is this someone who's looking at a painting and wants to be left alone to enjoy it? Or is, this, is the human somehow giving off signals that they'd like the robot to explain more and, and so on, right? So again, this very fine line between leave me alone and I'm, I'm open to an interaction. Right? You got A robot is obviously going to have to be very careful in those kinds of situations. Right. We're talking about a robot waiter. So okay. Like for the first one, if like someone was pointing at the menu, I guess you'd be able to talk to them. Like recognizing face if someone was angry because they've been waiting for their food, you know. Absolutely, bring, right? Bring a free dessert. So any of you that have actually waited tables, right? This is pretty important is knowing when when someone sitting at a table would like some attention or would rather be left alone to carry on the conversation. Again, tricky, right? Other examples. Physiotherapy, again, for those of you that have been through it, it's extremely painful. It can be very frustrating. How would the robot know that the subject is having difficulty? Right? We remember our discussion about affective computing. A rehabilitation robot is going to have to be very sensitive to the current affect of the patient. How would you know? It's looking at space and see if the patient is wincing in pain, right? This is going to be extremely important. My mom's a physical therapist, and she kind of calls physical therapy like half physical therapy, half psychotherapy. Okay. So it's, I think it would actually be very hard to use a robot in that instance because just pain, you know, makes people feel all sorts of emotions. So Absolutely. It's hard to do that. Absolutely. Okay, something to think about. Uh, obviously, this is probably a technology that's going to take a while for, for it to be adopted for exactly the reasons we've talked about, right? A robot that's off doing its own thing at a construction site or, or somewhere that where there hum aren't humans directly in the loop, we're much more willing to put up with uh, a wide range of actions, right? The moment we're thinking about robots that are interacting with humans, they need to be extremely sensitive to certain social cues and the particular social cues are going to be different in different situations, right? What are the particular social cues in this social context that, that matter? Okay, we've got about 10 minutes left, so let's move on to uh, our, our last domain, which is robot-robot interaction. So we've talked about robots and how they should interact with their physical environment, how should robots interact in social, socially with people, how, do ro how should robots interact with each other. So now we've got two or more robots, and the behavior, the output of one robot is sensed by another robot, and vice versa. Why would we want to create collective robotics? Well, there are lots of problems out there for which we might want to apply robotics, but it would be difficult to create one large complex machine to do it. Instead, it would be easier to create lots of relatively simple machines that coordinate their actions to get the job, the job done. Okay, uh, I was Googling around uh, yesterday and found this uh, very recent example, Zooids, which is nice because it 
uh, has a very nice connection to HCI. Okay, pretty, uh, pretty limited so far, but you can sort of see the beginnings of how this might be useful from an HCI point of view. Okay, pretty simple robots. What are their actuation capabilities and what are their sensing capabilities? They can't do much and they can't sense much. <coughs> Oops, not that one. What are their action capabilities here? What can any one robot do and not do? Just move around, right? It's hard to see, but there's probably two wheels underneath, and it can rotate those two wheels forward and back, not unlike the Bradenburg vehicles. Pretty simple. What are these <coughs> machines able to sense? Proximity to each other. Proximity to each other, right? So there's probably... Uh, something, uh, Wi-Fi or so, something inside that they can detect proximity to each other. And? Direction. Direction. So they seem to be able to go to places that are being indicated. In this example here, how do they know where they're supposed to go? What is the signal being given off by the human? So in this case, this is, these are both swarm robots and socially aware robots. There's a human in the loop. Just putting two That's it. So the robots are somehow aware of the human in this case. How? As you can tell, they're pretty small. There's probably not a lot going on inside. How do they know? Uh, the one's being held on either side can probably do a sun sensor that maybe heat sensor or something like that. They know that they're being used on by Exactly. So whatever it is, there is a thing out there which can resist my own self-movement. I'm spinning my wheels, and I sense that I'm not moving, right? It could be that. It could be heat. It could be something else. So there are two robots here that broadcast, I'm trapped, or I'm held. How do the others respond? So they're all running some little piece of code which is supposed to result in them forming a ring. How do they do that? Do you think that the two held robots are broadcasting a signal saying, robot 7, go to coordinates X and Y, robot 13, go to these coordinates, robot 12, go to these coordinates? You could do that. Um, the ones that are being held are excluded from the ones that have to finish that. Okay. They're done, right? They don't need to move anymore. They know they can't. But they're going to have to help their friends somehow. So if you were one of these two trapped robots, what would you do? You could start issuing detailed commands like robot 13 go to this position, robot 12 go to this position. The key to collective robotics is to think carefully, again, about the physical context here on this tabletop. What could you do to exploit this interaction where you wouldn't have to issue these detailed commands? I mean, it kind of seemed like one would go to a point, and then if another one, like, go to that point, it would kind of, like, stop and, like, reconsider. So maybe, like, it, the, it's, like, a really basic instruction, and then if that one, like, doesn't work, try something else. Okay, so what the simplest thing that the trapped robots could try, the simplest message they could emit is what? Where they are on the board. Come, come to me. It's even simpler, right? You don't necessarily need to say, I'm at coordinate X and Y. It's come to me. And they're emitting some signal from their position outward. And how, without that robot having to advertise its explicit coordinates, how would an untrapped robot find it? One robot is emitting the command, come to me, but I'm not going to tell you where I am. I'm just telling you, come to me. 
Perhaps the signal strength. Signal strength. Where have we seen this already? The ants. The ants or the ants, yes, and? Oh, the fruit flies. The fruit flies and the? The things that were inspired by the fruit flies. The Bradenburg vehicles, right? The cross wires. So is the trapped robot signal stronger on my left or stronger on my right? Turn towards whichever side it's stronger. And that will cause, let me back up a little bit. cause the robots to approach the trapped robots. But obviously we don't want all the robots, the untrapped robots, clustering around the trapped ones. So one untrapped robot happens to get there first and stands next to it at some certain signal strength, so it's beginning the circle, right? It says, okay, I don't want to be too close, too far. Okay, I'm in a good position. Then what happens? So the trapped robot has attracted one untrapped robot and has got it in the right position. What do the, what do these two robots do at that point? If you want to form a circle, they both emit the signal, so then Dylan's will respond to both of them instead of just the one. Possibly, <coughs> maybe a little bit more specific. If they're both emitting the signal, what's going to happen? You're just going to get a cluster around those two. That's not quite what you want. So are they doing it kind of like diagonally too? Like they're doing a proximity to each other, but also like what's my proximity to the one way over there? And that's how they're creating the circle. Could be. It's possible. So the game here is not to figure out what they actually did, but what is the simplest possible way they could have done this? Once the, the first one gets there, you switch off the one that's been held first, and then the new one becomes the new source of information to do that all the way around. Absolutely, right? So I'm a trapped robot. I emit a signal. Somebody arrives in front of me. Somebody arrives behind me. Great. I go quiet because I'm satisfied. There is someone. We're, we're forming the conga line, right? There's someone in front of me, and there's someone behind me. My job is done. I go quiet. But I tell the robots in front or behind, now you signal, right? So the robot in front says, I need a partner. And the one behind says, I need a partner. And any that have no partners switch, continue to run their Bradenburg vehicle until they attach. And with something very, very simple like that, you would get the formation of a circle. The robots know nothing about humans. They know nothing about circles. They're using some version of a Bradenburg vehicle and collectively, by exploiting their environment, which now includes other robots, some of which are trapped and some of which are not, to form a circle. We're going to stop here, but I want you to think about that when we talk about collective robotics when we get back. How to exploit your environment, which includes other robots, to do whatever the swarm is supposed to do. Okay, you have a quiz due tonight. Uh, report two when we get back. Have a good Thanksgiving break.